Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to our bonus video with the practice questions for the endodontic section of the National Board Dental Exam Part 2. So this is an outline of everything we talked about in our endodontic series. So if you haven't already, I would strongly recommend watching the entire series on endodontics. It looks overwhelming, but we broke it down to the most high yield information in bite-sized pieces for each of these seven topics here. And as you will see, this information will really help you on the board exam. So I compiled several questions for us to go through together from old released questions, practice books, and questions that I modeled after actual exam questions when I took the exam. So these are going to be very similar to what you will see on test day. As always, feel free to pause the video after I read each question and think through the answer before we go over it together. I'm also going to use this video to flesh out some miscellaneous topics that I didn't necessarily get a chance to cover in the previous videos. So my hope is that this video will both tie things all together and give you an opportunity to apply what you learned in the series. All right, question number one. An eight-year-old patient presents with an Ellis class two fracture of tooth number eight. In an effort to attain a pulpal diagnosis, which of the following tests is least reliable? So go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so for each question, let's break it down and start with what we know. So you may recall an Ellis class two fracture involves both the enamel and dentin layers, but that's actually not relevant to the question being asked, which is asking about diagnostic testing. And so we know vitality testing is unreliable for two to eight weeks following a traumatic injury. So we could use that information to narrow our choices down to either A or B, because C and D aren't vitality tests, while A and B are. And if you recall, EPT, or electric pulp test, is by the numbers the least reliable pulp vitality testing method we have. So that's all there is to it. The answer is B. So for the board exam, remember that uh, percussion is generally regarded as the most reliable testing method, while EPT is generally regarded as the least reliable method. All right, question number two. Radiographic examination shows a horizontal fracture of the apical third of the root. The best treatment is which of the following? So go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so horizontal fracture, like with perforations, the more apically they happen, the better the prognosis. So the fact that it's apical may clue you in that we'd like a more conservative treatment option, eliminating some of the less conservative options like extraction and apicoectomy that are a little too extreme. And then apexification, along with apexogenesis, are for immature permanent teeth, not root fractures. So we can eliminate that choice as well. So we're left with A or B. Now, if you remember with horizontal fractures, we really had two routes. If the tooth was vital, we'd want to splint as soon as possible. If the tooth was necrotic, we'd have to do a root canal treatment. But vitality isn't provided here in the question, and we won't be able to receive a good vitality measurement until about two to eight weeks after trauma. So the best answer here, since we don't know vitality of the tooth, is the more conservative and comprehensive option, which is B. So A is definitely tempting, but the best answer is B, because say in eight weeks time, the tooth becomes necrotic. At that point, we can inform the patient and recommend the ideal treatment, which would then be a root canal treatment. But if the tooth were ultimately vital, Doing a premature root canal treatment 
before we could gather reliable evidence would be a poor treatment option. All right, so question number three. Pulpal anatomy dictates which of the following access openings for a maxillary first molar. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so I love questions like these because they're nice, cut, and dry. We don't need to know any of the nitty gritty details about the exact specifications of the access prep, just what shape it is. And honestly, guys, the majority of questions on the exam are kind of like this. If you know the high yield facts really well, which is always what I stress, you'll do really well on the exam. So here's an example of just being able to know the high yield facts. So a maxillary first molar, which commonly has three canals, the ideal access is a blunted triangle or rhomboidal shape, providing straight line access for those three canals. So the answer here is C. All right, question number four. Symptomatic irreversible pulpitis pain in which of the following sites is most likely to radiate to the ear? Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so this question is referencing the concept of referred pain, which we talked about in our first video, where tooth pain can actually be felt in other areas of the body. We talked about innervation of the teeth and face and briefly the nerve map associated with that. And so the trap answer here is maxillary molar because it's closest anatomically to the ear. But actually, preauricular pain often refers from mandibular molars, and that's because they both share V3 innervation, as you can see with this nerve map here. And so the answer here is D. Mandibular molars of these four are most likely uh, to radiate pain to the ear. All right, question number five. So before I read this question, I'm actually going to jump to an informative slide because like I alluded to before, unfortunately this topic of cracked tooth syndrome is something uh, basically a sort of miscellaneous and I didn't really have time to cover it in the previous videos. So I'm going to very quickly now because knowing this information can definitely net you at least one to two questions on the exam. So cracked tooth syndrome is basically this, uh, this syndrome collection of signs and symptoms that are associated with having a crack in a tooth. So, um, there's usually pain on biting and on release, but usually only when the patient bites a very certain way, on a certain cusp, let's say. And pain is usually more associated with the actual release of pressure rather than increased biting force. There's also sometimes sensitivity to cold and or hot, but the syndrome is sometimes completely asymptomatic and the patient doesn't feel uh, any symptoms associated with the crack. Now cracks usually extend deep into dentin and propagate mesiodistally, as you can see in this image very clearly, often on the marginal ridge of a posterior tooth. Dyes and transillumination are more helpful than radiographs because radiographs can easily miss this crack which occurs along one plane the radiograph isn't taken at multiple different angulations like a like a root fracture you won't be able to see it so radiographs aren't very helpful here you can also use a tooth sleuth on each cusp to aid in location of the crack so that would be using something like this tooth sleuth here and you uh, put this rounded tip on each cusp and have the patient bite down and see either on biting or on release or both, see if a certain cusp is really bothering them. And then that can help you along with using um, colored dyes and transillumination, lighting through the tooth, you can see where that crack is. If 
the pulp is healthy, you can splint the tooth with like an ortho band and observe or eventually crown that tooth. Or if the, the, the pulp is diseased, bacteria and byproducts have leaked into the pulp, for instance, through this crack, um, conservative root canal treatment, and restoration with a crown because the tooth is a posterior tooth would be recommended. All right, so now that all that information is nice and fresh, we can revisit the question. So which of the following statements most likely applies to a cracked tooth? Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so uh, nice and fresh, the information, since it was on the last slide, and we can just kind of go right along here. So the direction of the crack, it's either mesiodistal or facial lingual, most likely, and you'll know it's mesiodistally because it's occurring along those, uh, across those marginal ridges of posterior teeth just like in the picture. It's a very uh, classic representation of uh, cracked tooth syndrome. And radiographic examination is not the best way to detect a cracked tooth. Uh, using the dyes or transillumination or even the tooth sleuth can be much more valuable than radiographs, which can easily miss a crack. So the answer of these is A only. All right, question number six. What is the clinical hallmark of a chronic periradicular abscess? Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so first of all, there may be some words that look confusing or unfamiliar in this question or in any question that you get on the board exam. And my single best advice for you is always take a deep breath and start with what you know. Remember, you know more than you may think you do. The question is asking about the characteristic clinical feature of a chronic periradicular abscess. Well, maybe I, I don't remember that exactly. I don't remember this chronic periradicular abscess. It doesn't sound familiar, but I do remember there was an acute apical abscess and chronic apical abscess. And well, periradicular means around the root, similar to meaning apical. And you could kind of go through this thought process. It's very similar looking to chronic apical abscess. And in fact, this is absolutely synonymous with a chronic apical abscess. And once you know that, you may know the one defining feature that we talked about with a chronic apical abscess is a sinus tract. And so the hallmark is simply sinus tract drainage, the one with sinus tract in the answer. And the answer for this question is B. And there you go. All right, question number seven. Which of the following tissues will not regenerate after a root canal treatment? So go ahead pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so this is kind of a fun question, I think. We never really talked about this directly, but we did cover all the information you need to know in the pulp biology section. So if we remember, root canal treatment is sort of like a pulpectomy where we remove all of the pulp tissue and followed by cleaning, shaping, and then obturation and filling. So we completely remove the pulp tissue, which contains odontoblasts. Now without odontoblasts, the tooth can no longer make dentin, like the tertiary dentin that we stimulate to form with uh, calcium hydroxide. The other three tissues can regenerate with a healing response because the cells that make them are still intact. But since odontoblasts are thrown away with the pulp tissue, the tooth loses its ability to create dentin. So the answer is A. All right, question number eight. While performing non-surgical endodontic therapy, you detect a ledge. What should you do? Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this question. All right, so ledging was one of the procedural complications we had talked about and a ledge is an artificial irregularity 
created on the surface of a root canal wall. So let's go through the answer choices. I'm going to skip over A for a second. B, fill as far as you have reamed. Well, B would be leaving part of the root canal apical to the ledge completely untreated, and which could absolutely lead to failure, failure, leaving bacteria in the root canal untreated. So um, that's not a great option. Using a small round burr and remove the ledge. Well, it certainly sounds nice, but using a round burr to remove a ledge is really impractical, if not impossible, when working in such a confined space. And how about D? Continue working gently to remove the ledge. So this answer choice is definitely enticing. But continuing to do what you're doing to remove a ledge, no matter how gentle you may be, will only make things worse. You're just feeding into that ledge that you've created artificially with the file, and you're not following the natural curve of the canal. So definitely the ideal method here of the options is to use a smaller file to renegotiate the natural canal. And you can maybe even place a curve in the file like we talked about to try and avoid the ledge, but this can be very technically challenging. So the answer is A and we want to bypass the ledge by maybe curving it or certainly using a smaller instrument to try to get past this ledge that we created and follow the natural canal. All right, so before I read this question, I'm going to go on to the topic of vertical root fracture, which again is another mis miscellaneous topic I wasn't able to cover in the previous videos, so I definitely wanted to make sure I got a chance to cover it for you all now. So vertical root fracture starts apically and progresses coronally in terms of its uh, general development as a lesion. So it can occur after cementation of a post or most commonly excessive condensation forces on an overprepared canal. So when you condense the gutta percha too forcefully, that's the number one iatrogenic cause of a vertical root fracture. When, when you uh, probe around the tooth with a vertical root fracture, it says here isolated probing defect at the site of the fracture. What that means is everything basically seems normal within normal limits. And then you have this sudden drop of the probe to like a, a 10 millimeter pocket, let's say, and seems totally out of the ordinary. That's because the pocket is going down to where the vertical root fracture has extended to apically. And so the isolated probing defect is right at the site of the fracture. It's accompanied by often a J-shaped or teardrop radiolucency and this is a sinister thing. This vertical root fracture is definitely not something that you want for your patients. For a single rooted tooth, really the, the only thing we can do for this tooth, it's a hopeless prognosis, really can't save it, and we have to extract the tooth. If it's a multi-rooted tooth, we can either extract the tooth or, a bit more conservatively, just resect the affected root with the fracture in it. So now that we know all of this, we can revisit our question. The ideal treatment option for a vertical root fracture is which of the following? So go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so the moral of this story here is if you see the words vertical root fracture, or if you are given clues that heavily suggest a vertical root fracture, this would be the time to pick extraction as your answer. So vertical root fracture, think extraction on the exam. All right, question number 10. Which of the following conditions indicates a periodontal problem rather than an endodontic problem exists? Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this one. All right, so this is a test of our knowledge of periapical diagnoses. 
So we basically have a bunch of different descriptions of the different, different uh, periapical diagnoses here. And then we have our right answer somewhere in between them. So acute pain to percussion with no swelling. Acute pain to percussion, no swelling. So that would rule out acute apical abscess. This certainly sounds like a symptomatic apical periodontitis. So we know that's endodontic in nature. I'm going to skip B for the time being and move to C. So C, a deep, narrow, circular pocket to the apex with exudate. So this could actually be referring to what we just talked about, vertical root fracture, a deep, narrow pocket in the sulcus to the apex. That could certainly be a vertical root fracture. Now, the fact that it mentions with exudate, yes, that could be vertical root fracture, or maybe even a sinus tract, because pus can drain from the PDL. So it could be associated with a chronic, uh, chronic apical abscess. But either way, this is not really a periodontal problem. So we can rule out A as well as C so far. Now let's go to D. Pain to palpation of the buccal mucosa near the tooth apex. So pain to palpation of the buccal mucosa right over that apex well, again, that certainly sounds like it's symptomatic, and symptomatic apical, periodont uh, symptomatic apical periodontitis definitely is, um, is the answer here for this uh, answer choice because that is one of those symptoms. We have percussion covered in A and palpation covered in D, and when you're positive to those findings, you can certainly think of symptomatic apical periodontitis being on the periapical diagnosis. All right, so and even though it does say periodontitis in the name, it's apical periodontitis, which has originated from an endodontic problem. So yeah, that basically rules out A, C, and D, and we're left with B. Now, um, well, I just wanted to briefly cover the importance here is this distinction between narrow and wide circular pockets. So the narrow has to do with like that vertical root fracture or some sort of uh, fracture or maybe even a draining, uh, draining sinus tract, whereas uh, wide sulcus is a telltale sign of a perio problem. And this idea of lateral percussion especially, because lateral percussion means we're loading the side of the PDL. And so there's certainly some sort of problem that has originated in the sulcus. So the answer for this question is B. But now I know I'm crossing over to the realm of periodontics a little bit, but I do want to briefly introduce something and illuminate some important key points that I covered in this question. So we're talking a little bit about the distinction between perio and endo lesions. So as I mentioned, an endo lesion originates in the pulp. That would be this first picture here. We have the pulp and then arrows showing this, um, this lesion has originated from the pulp and is spreading from it as its source of origin. Whereas a perio problem originates in the sulcus. And so this perio problem is in the sulcus and now the lesion has spread from it. And so it's entering in and it could even enter into the pulp. And so it could cause an endo problem, but it's originating in the sulcus. So an endo lesion originates in the pulp, a perio lesion originates in the sulcus. And then we also have a perio endo or a true combined lesion where it's really either hard to distinguish or it's originating truly from both places. And we have infectious agents that have originated in the sulcus as well as the pulp, and they're spreading from both of them. And so the question here is what we would do if we had an endo lesion, well, we'd wanna treat the, the, treat the pulp. If there's a perio lesion, we want to do periotherapy. If it's a perio endo true combined lesion, what do we do first? And that is a super common question on the board exam. If you have a perio endo lesion, which problem do you pursue first? 
And the answer by and large is treat the endodontic problem first and then do the periodontal therapy later. So that's something that could easily be a question on your board exam. So I just wanted to, uh, I didn't want to cross too much over into the world of periodontics because I'll eventually do a video series all on that topic. But I did want to mention for you that if you got something like this, you'd want to treat the endo first and then the perio second. All right, so back to our questions here. Question number 11. Endodontic infection usually is polymicrobial. What is the predominant type of microorganism found in a tooth that requires endodontic therapy? Go ahead and pause the video while I take a drink of water, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so a tooth that requires endodontic treatment for the first time, which would be a tooth with a primary endodontic infection, contains a very specific type of bacteria. And that bacteria, if you recall, is Bacteroides, which is a gram-negative obligate anaerobe. So if you can remember that fact right off the top of your head, that's awesome, you'll know the answer is C. And we can kind of uh, reason this backwards a little bit because we're always wanting to, in the root canal treatment process, flushing out that canal, uh, aerating it, which would introduce oxygen. And so something that's an obligate anaerobe would hate oxygen and actually couldn't live in the presence of oxygen. And so that, that process of aerating the canal, flushing it out, would also kill those bacteria. So that's another way to think about it. Um, if you couldn't remember that the fact that it's a gram-negative obligate anaerobe. Now, if the question had said that the tooth required endodontic retreatment, this answer would actually be very different. You know, on the slide I had on endodontic microbiology, a tooth with failed treatment houses a very different bacterial species, and that's Enterococcus faecalis, which is a gram-positive facultative anaerobe, which would actually make this answer B. So the, the point here is definitely it's important to read the question carefully because this one word therapy versus retreatment would mean two entirely different answers. So I just wanted to point that out um, for, for that purpose. All right, question number 12, the danger zone of mandibular molars for perforations during canal instrumentation is. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so the word perforation should immediately clue us in to one of those procedural complications that we talked about. And the danger zone was where we had to watch out because there's a significant concavity in the furcation area in mandibular molars. Now you flare the file out too much in this certain area during shaping and there will be no dentin left and we'll have a very bad strip perforation. So we know the concavity is on the inside in the furcation area so that would el immediately eliminate A and D which are on the outsides of the roots. And now A actually happens to be the safety zone where there's significantly thicker amount of dentin. And the other side of the safety zone on the distal area of that same mesial root is actually where we talked about the danger zone being present. So the answer is B. The distal area of the mesial root has that significant area of concavity where it's easiest to uh, cause a strip perforation. All right, question number 13. What constitutes the largest portion of gutta percha obturation material? Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so this one is another one of those straight up high yield fact recall questions. 
And as we talked about in our root canal treatment video, the main ingredient for the gutta percha points is actually not gutta percha, which is the naturally occurring thermoplastic agent, but rather zinc oxide, which is the filler used in gutta percha and the sealer that you can coat it with. So the answer here is B. Just be aware of that A trap answer. All right, question number 14. Which of the following statements most accurately describes the manufacturing process for a K-type hand instrument? Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this question. All right, so this question is another prime example of starting with what you know, because it's also an example of it's very easy to get caught in the weeds, so to speak. But if you keep it simple and focus on the high yield facts, you'll be good to go. So if you can associate this K-type wording, this K-type label means that the hand instrument is made out of stainless steel. So if you know K-type has to do with stainless steel, that means we can rule out answer choice B, which is talking about silver material, so that's not accurate, and we can rule out C, which talks about nickel titanium, and that's not the right material either. And so we can rule out B and C and all of the above because we know B and C are also incorrect. So that leaves us with answer choice A, and that's the answer. So what could be a little bit tricky is if you focus on this grinding versus twisting uh, nomenclature used in the answer choices, and that's kind of what I mean by getting caught in the weeds. Um, K-type files are described often as twisted squares, a twisted rhombus, or even a twisted triangle in cross-section because it looks like you took a square wire and just twisted it a bunch of times to get this pattern. But the actual manufacturing process involves grinding, not twisting the wire. But you don't really even need to know that for this question because as long as you can locate stainless steel, that's all the, the question really is uh, requiring you to know. So knowing that K-type is a stainless steel wire, you are good to go. All right, so the first day of the board's exam will be 400 questions, like the ones we've just talked about with endodontics questions sprinkled throughout. Now on the second day, you will have 100 more questions that are case-based. So they'll give you information on a patient with some clinical photographs and x-rays, and otherwise the questions are very similar. And here's an example of that. So question number 15, this emergency patient presents with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis and symptomatic apical periodontitis of tooth number 12. Which of the following is the best treatment protocol for this patient? So go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this case-based question. All right, so the word emergency should already tip off the fact that we're thinking about some urgent care position here. And so uh, when we're thinking in that uh, mode of thinking, you know, incis incision and drainage is definitely an emergency uh, treatment, so we can consider that, but that's for localized fluctuant swelling, which the patient does not report or present with. So we can probably rule out that answer choice. You know, extraction is another emergency procedure, certainly possible, but maybe a bit extreme for uh, some symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, but we'll keep it in the back of our heads. Now, if we skip ahead to answer choice D, antibiotics are for signs of spreading infection, like if the patient has a fever or lymphadenopathy or diffuse swelling, but definitely not for a toothache. So this is not something we would want to do for this patient. And now you may recall that pulpectomy is often used as a temporary pain relief on a tooth with irreversible pulpitis until a full root canal treatment 
could be done. And this is the perfect treatment here because we have a patient presenting to an emergency clinic scenario and they have a toothache and the pulp is the problem. So we need to treat the endo problem and doing so with the pulpectomy by removing that diseased pulp would be the ideal scenario. So C is definitely the best answer to treat this patient. All right, and I have to apologize. I usually try to keep these to 15 questions total, but I, I really couldn't help myself because I almost guarantee you'll get a question asking about EDTA on your exam. So I just want to uh, go through this one really quickly. When you follow up with this patient that we just talked about, we did the pulpectomy and now we want to perform the full root canal treatment, you use EDTA to lubricate the canal. What is this material best categorized as? Go ahead and pause the video one last time and then we'll talk about this question. All right, so like I said, this is probably very similar to a question you will certainly certainly have a high probability of getting something asking about EDTA. And so it's a very common agent used in endodontics and uh, bleach or uh, I should say sodium hypochlorite is also another very common uh, agent used in endodontics. So sodium hypochlorite is an irrigant, that's C, that dissolves organic material, but we're not being asked about sodium hypochlorite. We're being asked about the other thing, EDTA. And EDTA, as opposed to bleach, is a chelating agent that dissolves inorganic material, like the smear layer of dentin. So combining both sodium hypochlorite, which is an irrigant which dissolves organic material, and EDTA, which is a chelating agent that chelates or binds to these inorganic uh, or inorganic ions and, and dissolves inorganic material, are the dream team for endodontic treatment. So knowing uh, both sodium hypochlorite and EDTA and their classification and function is definitely something that could net you at least one or two questions on the exam. So sorry, but I just had to throw that in there at the very end. So hopefully you found this video um, very helpful for your preparation, the National Board Dental Exam Part 2. As I said in the beginning, these are questions that are very similar to ones you'll see on actual test day. And uh, they're all things that we talked about in our previous videos, or if I uh, didn't get a chance to, I mentioned them in this video. So hopefully after this entire series, you have a very comprehensive understanding of endodontics and you can go into test day feeling very confident that you'll be able to tackle any endodontics question you get asked. So thanks so much for watching everyone and we'll see you all in the next video.